Yesterday, I discussed how the Senate's serious fact-based approach to the coronavirus crisis has cut a sharp contrast with House Democrats' political theater. Back in March, as the economic fallout from this crisis was just beginning, it fell to the Senate to write, negotiate, and pass the CARES Act. With the House absent from Washington, Senate Republicans turned a blank sheet of paper into an outline for the largest rescue package in American history. We negotiated with our Democratic colleagues, and we made a law. House Democrats tried to insert unrelated wish list items at the 11th hour, things like tax credits for solar panels. But the Republican Senate stood strong. And because we did, for three months now, the unanimous bipartisan CARES Act has been the cornerstone of the federal government's response to this crisis. Doctors, nurses, and hospitals have received historic federal funding to supplement their efforts. Households receive direct checks. Tens of millions of Americans have kept getting paychecks and not pink slips because of our Small Business Saving Paycheck Protection Program. These are the historic programs the Senate has spent weeks overseeing and adjusting where necessary. Now, a few weeks ago, House Democrats jetted into town for a day or two, just long enough to make another unserious contribution to again use this crisis for partisan wish listing. You don't have to take my word for it. The media completely panned it. NPR called it, quote, a long wish list for Democrats. Another journalist wrote, neither this bill nor anything resembling it will ever become law. And listen to this reporting, quote, privately several House Democrats concede their latest bill feels like little more than an effort to appease the most liberal members of their caucus. This is the proposal that our Senate Democratic colleagues keep thundering that we should take up and pass here. Something so unserious that it had House Democrats themselves rolling their eyes. Remember, among other things, this bill would give taxpayer-funded checks to illegal immigrants. And it would change tax law to provide massively expensive gifts to wealthy people in high-tax blue states. These are their coronavirus priorities. This political theater is the opposite of the serious Senate approach that built the CARES Act. Any further recovery efforts should focus intently on three things, kids, jobs, and health care. Kids, jobs, and health care. To step back toward normalcy, our country will need K through 12 and college students to resume their schooling. We'll need to re-energize hiring to get workers their jobs back. And we'll need continued progress in the health care fight to get ready for the fall and winter and speed the search for a vaccine. One helpful policy would be strong legal protection for schools, colleges, nonprofits, and employers that are putting their necks on the line to reopen. So long as institutions follow the best available guidelines, they should not have to live in fear of a second academic, <clears throat> a second epidemic of frivolous lawsuits. Believe me, the virus is worry enough. These are the kinds of smart solutions Washington must continue discussing as we evaluate what further steps may be necessary. Partisan theater and politicized wish lists are not what the country needs. Now, in another matter, as I've said for weeks, our domestic challenges cannot take Congress eye off the ball of world affairs. So, as the Senate passed other major bills, the Senate Republicans tried to advance police reform until Democrats blocked us. Our colleagues on the Armed Services Committee have worked hard to assemble the next National Defense Authorization Act. <coughs> Every year, the NDAA allows us to speak clearly about the Senate's priorities on matters of national defense. As China continues to treat maritime arteries like its own backyard sandbox, the men and women of the U.S. 7th Fleet and the entire Indo-Pacific Command remain on call to maintain order. 
As Russia doubles down on its support of brutal dictators and attacks democratic regimes in dark corners of the web, U.S. Cyber Command remains vigilant and our NATO relationships remain vital. And as tyrants from Tehran to Pyongyang pave over their citizens in pursuit of power, we need our sharpest minds and best tools watching their every move. Our armed forces stand watch over our homeland and they stand watch over an entire international order that shares our peaceful values and benefits our nation. And now our military has also risen to the unique task of helping respond to the pandemic. Military medical facilities have added critical capacity during the first surge of COVID-19. From Navy hospital ships to soldiers from the 531st Hospital Center at Fort Campbell. National Guard personnel have established and manned temporary testing facilities across the country. DOD research facilities have joined the race to develop treatments. So Madam President, as our service members confront challenges new and familiar, our job is to advance an NDAA that supports them and their families. Chairman Inhofe and Senator Reid led a productive bipartisan process in committee. I hope we will see a bipartisan amendment process out here on the floor as well. But already, the bill will make major steps forward. It not only supports service members while they're at their duty stations, but also on the home front. This year's bill encourages expanded telemedicine capabilities in the military healthcare system, and it will help retain highly trained providers. It implements new quality standards for acquisitions of military family housing and increase impact aid to school districts that support large numbers of military children. It revises sexual assault prevention policies to destroy barriers to victims seeking justice. And it includes further steps to ensure all these efforts are supported by a more efficient and transparent administrative structure over at the Pentagon. That means changes to compensation to attract top talent, expanded access to cutting edge software, and new checks on the department's budget planning process to increase accountability. So Madam President, the US military is the greatest fighting force the world has ever seen. Our work in the coming days is meant to ensure that this remains the case. Supporting service members and their families are critical pieces of this year's NDAA. Our men and women in uniform are simply the best, and they deserve the best. 